Welcome to the video for chapter four. We're going to be talking about part two of electric fields today. Remember that last time we talked about electric fields due to point charges. So there's a certain amount of coulombs at a particular point. But unfortunately, that's not very realistic because points don't really exist in, in the real world. They're a, geometric, they're a geometrical construct. So we're going to consider what happens when you have three dimensional regions of charge or approximations of that as two dimensional regions of charge and one dimensional regions of charge. So we'll be able to consider linear charge density, surface charge density, and volume charge density. And we'll be able to use integrals and double integrals to be able to calculate the electric field due to those regions of charge. Before we get into the meat of the material today, I just wanted to mention that the word electron, and therefore electronics, and therefore electrical engineering, and, and a lot of words that are very near and dear to us, all come from the ancient Greek word for amber. Uh, that was the word electron, because they, they uh, knew that if you rubbed amber with a type of fur, often it was cat's fur, uh, you'd be able to uh, generate static electricity. And they didn't understand what static electricity was, but it was the first time that they had ever encountered it, and they were able to uh, uh, associate that with a new force. And so electron was the name that, that we use for, for the, the, the sort of the new world of that force. So let's talk a little bit about charge densities. Now, uh, charge densities, of course, all real charge densities are three-dimensional. So we don't have point charges, we don't really have surface charges, we don't really have linear charges. It's always three-dimensional. Everything in our world is three-dimensional. But we can approximate things uh, as two-dimensional, one-dimensional, or even as a point charge. So you can see here in figure 4.1, this is what it would look like if we had uh, a three-dimensional region of charge, either a cube or a cylinder. Uh, we can represent the charge density of, of a three-dimensional charge as rho sub v. We will call that the volume charge density. And it's Q, the total charge, divided by the volume. That's assuming, of course, that it's a uniform charge density, which we're going to make that assumption for almost all of the examples we're going to use in this class. But just know that in reality, uh, that the charge density can vary from point to point. Uh, we can also talk about things that are approximately two-dimensional, things like a sheet of paper. A sheet of paper might seem as though it doesn't have a thickness, but if you stack a thousand of them up, it makes it into a pretty thick book. Uh, or like a pancake. A pancake looks like it's almost two-dimensional, but of course, if you stack five or six of them up, that's quite a breakfast. So we can see that, that we've got a lot of things that, that can be approximated as two-dimensional, but in reality have a, a third dimension. It's just that it's very thin. Uh, and if we have an object like that, we can approximate it as being two-dimensional, and there we, we would refer to the surface charge density, rho sub s. That would be Q divided by A, just coulombs per square meter, instead of coulombs per cubic meter. It would just be coulombs per square meter. And then you can have uh, a, a single line of charge, which would be something like, you know, like a straw or like a piece of spaghetti or a copper wire. This would be approximately one dimensional uh, because it's very thin in two of the three dimensions. And there we would, we would approximate it as, as being one dimensional. We would refer to it as having a linear charge density, Q divided by L, and that would just be coulombs per meter. It's important that we would always refer to these as rho sub v, rho sub s, and rho sub l, and never just by rho, because rho, of course, is one of the variables that we used in cylindrical coordinates. And as we're going to see in some of the examples today, we often combine rho with rho sub s, rho with rho sub l. We need to be able to keep those variables separate and make sure that we understand that they're two different things. Just bad, bad coincidence that bo they both happen to use rho, uh, but we, if we put the subscript on there and we're careful about it, it won't be a problem. So let's talk a little bit about some one-dimensional calculations, but in general, let's talk about what it means to have continuous charge. So if we have a continuous region of charge, whether it be one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional, we need to break that down into smaller charges. So we're going to break it down into infinitesimally small differential charges, and then we're going to add up the effect of each of those differential charges using superposition. We learned about superposition last time. We can use it today to great effect. And it turns out that, that, that this is a problem that is really designed for calculus because having a whole bunch of little things that are then added together, <clears throat> that's kind of the definition of an integral. So we're going to be doing a lot of integrals in doing the calculations we're doing today. Now you remember equation 3.5, which I've sort of duplicated here for your convenience. I just wanted to remind you that the equation 3.5 looked like this, and we now have a new version of the equation, which is very similar. You'll notice that we still have the 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. That's exactly the same as it was up here. We have the 1 over r squared. That's the exact same as it was here. We have the a sub r. That's the same as it was there. And really, the only thing that's changed is that this discrete charge has now become an integral of rho sub v with respect to the volume. 
And so uh, it's really the same calculation. It's just that now we have a, a continuous charge rather than a, than a discretized one. We can also simplify that problem, or we can simplify that equation significantly if we assume that we're going to have uh, a, a constant, a uniform charge density, and if we're focusing on just a one-dimensional problem. So in that case, what would have, let me scroll back up here again, notice that this one would have been a volume, oh, oops, sorry, I don't know why that jumped like that. It would have been a volume integral, but now we're going to be able to, to reduce it down to just a one-dimensional integral. So here you can see this would have been a volume integral right here, but now it's going to become just a one-dimensional integral right here. And uh, we'll, this a sub r, we're going to include that for the moment, but we're going to be able to really omit the a sub r as long as we keep track of that ourselves. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to use the vector as long as we know the, the direction of the electric field that we're calculating. So <clears throat> the dq is going to become a rho sub l dx. The rho sub l is constant, so we're going to move that out in front of the, uh, out in front of the integral sign. And this, this integral now becomes substantially simpler than it otherwise would have been. Let's see our first example of that. Uh, we're going to calculate the electric field at a distance rho along the perpendicular bisector of a quasi two-dimensional object. Oh, that should say, sorry, that should say a quasi one-dimensional object. Quasi one-dimensional object of length A and charge density rho sub L. So we've got a problem here where we, we know that there's a point that is directly above the center of this line. And so as we as we're working on this one, we're going to uh, consider a small region of charge somewhere along the line. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shade that one in right here. And I'm just going to try to symmetrically indicate the same region of charge on the other end of the line. Now, maybe that's not perfectly symmetric, but it's pretty close. And I'm going to draw the line to each of these. So this, this right here is going to be what we're going to refer to as R. Sometimes I'll use a capital R, sometimes it'll be a lowercase r. Uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and call this distance here, I'll call this Z, and this distance here is going to be DZ. So if I'm looking at this one, I, I can see that, that this, this element over here on the right is going to create an electric field that's going to, assuming that this is a positive charge, the electric field is going to push away. And so I'll call this DE1, and then the electric or the charge density on the left is going to push away toward the right, and I'll call this DE2. Now I can break each of those into their components, so there will be a component of DE2, and that will be in the Z direction, so DE2 in the Z direction. There's also a DE1 in the Z direction, and there's a DE1 in the rho direction, DE1 in the rho direction, and then there's also a DE2 in the rho direction. Now what you'll notice is that the DE, uh, the DEZs, DEZs are going to cancel. So they're going to be equal and opposite to each other. Symmetry of the problem says that this value and this value are going to be pointing in the opposite direction. And because I've chosen symmetric points, they're going to have the, the same value. So those are going to go away. Those are going to cancel each other out. But the DE rows, oh, and there should not be an apostrophe there. Sorry about that. The DE rows should add because they're both pointing in the same direction. Now the question is if I can calculate DE rho as a function of just the overall DE. Well, I've got this theta right here. I'll, I'll call that theta. And as it turns out by symmetry, that's also theta. And by geometry, that's theta. And by, ge by geometry, that's also theta. And technically, these two lines right here are actually just one line. So it's just one line that's pointing, one vector that's pointing down there. <clears throat> the question is do we know uh, anything about uh, DE? two row or DE1 row as a function of DE1. Well, yes, it turns out that DE, uh, DE in the row direction, and I will, I'll just drop the one and two because they're really going to be just continuous here. This is going to be equal to DE times the cosine of theta. Notice that the cosine is going to take the adjacent side, which is, which in fact is this side right here, uh, divided by the hypotenuse, which is this side right here. And so when I, when I take the ratio of those two, I end up with DE rho is equal to DE times the cosine of theta. 
You might say to yourself, well, how does that help us? Well, it turns out that we actually do know what the cosine of theta is. It's just that we know what the cosine of this theta is. So I'm going to take the cosine of theta is rho divided by r. So cosine of theta is rho divided by r. And then the question you might ask is, well, then what is r? Well, we know that this quantity is z. We know that this is a right angle. We know that this quantity is rho. So therefore, r squared is equal to rho squared plus z squared. And so therefore, we can see that the cosine of theta is equal to rho divided by the square root of rho squared plus z squared. So that's, that gives us a significant head start on solving this problem uh, just by doing a little bit of analysis of the geometry and this idea of breaking the problem into two components, one of which will cancel and one of which will add, we're going to see that in practically every problem we're going to talk about today. So let's write out our, our master equation, DE, that's the overall electric field, is going to be DQ divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. And that is the same thing as rho sub L, well that's a little bit sloppy on the rho there, rho sub L times dz divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. So we've taken rho sub L, which is the charge density, multiplied it by the, by the length of the differential element, and that gives us the differential amount of charge. And so I can, I can go ahead and do one more step here. Rho sub L dz over 4 pi epsilon zero, and what did I say r squared was? Well up here, r squared is rho squared plus z squared. So this is going to be rho squared plus z squared. Okay, now I, I know what I really want is dE in the rho direction, and that's going to be dE cosine of theta, and that's going to be equal to uh, as we saw, rho divided by the square root of rho squared plus z squared. That right there is cosine theta um, multiplied by dE, which is simply this expression right here. So this is going to be rho sub L dz over 4 pi epsilon 0 rho squared plus z squared. Now we can do, uh, we can do an integral. And that integral is going to be e sub rho. e sub rho is the integral of dE rho. And that will be over the full length of the, of the wire. Now remember that the length of the wire is the length of A. But I'm, I'm taking the origin to be right at the center, right here at the center of the, of the wire. So it's going to go from negative A over 2 up to positive A over 2. And so that's going to be my limits of integration, is from minus a over 2 up to positive a over 2. And I can then plug in what I just found for dE rho. I'm going to, uh, I will do an integral from minus a over 2 up to a over 2. I'm going to combine this uh, square root of rho squared plus z squared, so the part right here, I'm going to combine that with rho squared plus z squared, remembering that the square root is to the one-half power. So this really becomes rho times rho sub L. There's a great example of why we have to have that subscript, because they're mixed together there. dz divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 rho squared plus z squared. I have to the one-half power multiplied by to the one power, so that's to the one and a half power, which we usually write as to the three halves power. Okay, so I've got some, uh, let, let, I'll go ahead and go to the next page so that we've got enough room. I'll try to leave that there so we can see it. So E sub rho, I'm going to pull out uh, a few constants here. Rho sub L is a constant and rho is a constant. Remember that that's the distance away from the wire that we are. Uh, we've got the 4 pi epsilon 0. Those are constants. All constants can come out in front of the integrals. And we're left with an integral from minus a over 2 up to plus a over 2. And that's going to be the integral of, the numerator now is just dz divided by rho squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. And if you look at this up in the table of useful integrals for ECE 430, 
we'll be able to uh, easily plug this one in. Rho sub L times rho over four pi epsilon zero. Of course, you could also use Wolfram alpha, or you could use trig substitution, which, which is how this one was solved in the first place. This is z divided by rho squared times the square root of rho squared plus z squared from minus a over 2 up to plus a over 2. Okay, so I can, in my next step, I'm going to uh, pull out uh, this rho squared in the denominator. This becomes rho sub l times rho divided by 4 pi epsilon 0, and then there'll be a rho squared in the denominator. <clears throat> and this becomes, I have to do the top limit first, so that's a over 2 divided by rho squared times the square root of rho squared plus a over 2 squared. And then I subtract when I plug in the bottom limit. So this is minus negative a over 2 divided by rho squared times the square root of rho squared plus negative a over 2, the quantity squared. Uh, it turns out that the, the two negative signs here are going to cancel each other out, and the denominators are identical. It turns out that, of course, this term, which is the negative a over 2, the quantity squared, is the same thing as this term, the positive a over 2, the quantity squared. So, oh, and I can also cancel this row cancels with that squared. So I'm left with rho sub L over 4 pi epsilon 0 rho. Oh, I see that I accidentally included the rho squared here twice. So that should not be there. Oops, and that should not be there because we already included it right here. I'm going to have then 2 times a over 2 divided by the square root of rho squared plus a over 2, the quantity squared. And when solving a problem like this, you'll often find, uh, I don't know how much further I should go on this. I'm going to go just one or two more steps further, <clears throat> because this is a result that we might be using in the future. So this, I'm going to have this be uh, rho sub L over, and I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take one of, I'm going to take half of this. I'm going to leave half of it behind, and I'm going to move half of it into the square root. So I'm going to have rho sub L over 2, 2 pi epsilon 0 rho, then that's going to be multiplied by a, uh, I'll go ahead and put the a right here, multiplied by 1 over the square root of, and when I bring 2 in under the square root, it becomes a 4. This becomes 4 rho squared plus, and then the 4 cancels with this 2 right here, and this becomes 4 squared plus a squared. And so this is what I believe is the final answer for the electric field that is a distance of rho away from the perpendicular bisector of a line that is of length a and has a charge density of rho sub l. Now let's calculate the electric field at a distance rho at any point along an infinite line. Well, here's the good news. We just calculated the harder calculation, which is uh, a finite line. Now we're just going to take the limit as a goes to infinity uh, of this e sub rho that we just calculated. So this is the limit as a goes to infinity of rho sub l a divided by 2 pi epsilon 0 rho times 1 over the square root of 4 rho squared plus a squared. Well, if a is going to infinity, this 4 rho squared term is going to, is going to be negligible. And so this denominator becomes 1 over the square root of a squared, which is just a. And so therefore, this a is going to cancel with this entire term. We're just left with rho sub l over 2 pi epsilon 0 rho. And so the only things that it really depends on are the charge density of the line, uh, which is now infinitely long, but still has the same charge density per unit length, and the distance that you are away from that line. Let's do another example, which you're going to find to be very similar, I think. Uh, let's calculate the total, or calculate the electric field at a distance z away from a thin loop of charge with a radius a containing a total charge of q. So again, I'm going to take two points. I'll take this one, and I'll, and I'll take this one. I've chosen them strategically to be geometrically opposite of each other, so that as the electric fields are added, the component in the u sub rho direction, so this is e sub rho, and this is e, and this is e sub rho, 
and this is E, the E sub rows are going to cancel. So the E sub rows cancel, but the E sub Z's are going to add. So the E sub Z's add. So if I needed to figure out how can I how can I calculate those again, it's going to be the same trick with the theta. So I've got theta is there and there and there and there, and I'm going to be able to see. Um, let's see, uh, D E Z is going to be equal to D E times the cosine of theta, and I have again a right triangle where I have a Z and an A as the two legs and R as the hypotenuse. So this then is equal to DE times the adjacent side, which is going to be Z divided by R, which is the hypotenuse. And of course we know that R squared is equal to A squared plus Z squared. So our final relationship is that DEZ is equal to DE times Z divided by R, which is the square root of A squared plus z squared. Now I also, for the first time, I'm going to need to treat this uh, in, a, in a sort of a circular fashion. So I'm going to have a differential length. So the differential length is going to be the radius a times d phi. Uh, as long as phi is listed in radians, that's kind of the definition of, of, of radians, is that it's going to be the arc length divided by the, <clears throat> divided by the radius. And if I know that dq is equal to rho sub l times dl, then, whoops, sorry about that, then dq is equal to a times rho sub l times dl. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, it's a times rho sub l times d5. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and plug all of this into my, into my equation. I'm going to go ahead and calculate what is EZ. EZ is going to be the integral, and I'm going to need to integrate around the entire circle. So that's going to be a, an integral of phi equals 0 up to 2 pi, 360 degrees. So I'm going to do an integral of the complete circle of DEZ, which is equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the cosine of theta times DE which is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the cosine of theta divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 times r squared dq. And I'm just substituting things in that we've already, that we've already figured out. And the next step is to substitute, it, substitute in uh, dq. So I have the integral from 0 to 2 pi cosine theta divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared times a rho sub l d phi. <clears throat> and now I can bring some constants out in front. e sub z is going to be rho sub l is a constant, a is a constant, 4 pi epsilon 0 are all constants, and then I'm left with an integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 over a squared plus z squared. This term, of course, is uh, r squared. And then multiplied by z divided by the square root of a squared plus z squared, where this, of course, is cosine theta. And this is left with d phi. <clears throat> OK, um, let's see. I can, bring, uh, I can bring that z out in front. And it turns out that. Oh gosh, a lot of these things are constants. Z is a constant and A is a constant. In fact, everything except for d phi is a constant. So I'm going to have rho sub L times A divided by 4 pi epsilon 0. <clears throat> I'm going to toss a Z on here in the numerator. And I'm going to put an A squared plus Z squared to the 3 halves power in the denominator. And I get an integral from 0 to 2 pi of d phi, well that's just 2 pi, right? That, that's about the simplest integral that I can do. So this gives me uh, rho sub l a z divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 a squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power times 2 pi. 
And again, you can ask yourself, how much simplification should we do? Well, I'm going to cancel out these pies, and I'm going to cancel out 2 with half of that 4. <clears throat> and I'll have e sub z is equal to rho sub l a times z divided by 2 epsilon 0 times a squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. The only thing I'm going to change now is uh, the original problem statement referenced Q rather than rho sub L. So I'm just going to remind myself that uh, rho sub L is equal to Q divided by the total length. Well, the length of this circle is the circumference of the circle. Since the radius is A, the circumference is 2 pi A. So this is divided by 2 pi A. And therefore, E sub Z uh, I'm going to now take this expression here, and I'm going to substitute it in for this rho sub L. This becomes Q over 2 pi A times AZ divided by 2 epsilon 0 times A squared plus Z squared to the 3 halves power. Uh, cancel the A's, and I'm left with Q times Z divided by Oh, 2 times 2 is 4, so I'm going to combine those together into a 4 pi epsilon 0. Looks familiar. a squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. And I believe that's my final answer. So that's the electric field that is near, uh, 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 above the center of a circle, a hollow circle, a hollow disk that has a total charge of Q on it, a distance z above the center, and the radius is a. Let's tackle some two-dimensional problems. So here, and rather than do any single integral, now we're going to need to do a double integral, and it's going to be an integral with respect to the surface rather than just a, a linear integral. But notice that still we're going to have this, this same idea, that it's still just doing an integral of charge, uh, and that, that we're going to be able to, uh, again, omit the a sub r because we're going to keep track of what direction we're working on uh, ourselves. So let's calculate the electric field at a distance z above the center of a rectangle of uniform charge density. Now I got to tell you, this is a, this is a challenging one. This is one that I, I actually I couldn't find anywhere on the internet. Uh, I did find some some hints to get me in the right direction, uh, but it's one that uh, this took about a day for me to figure out how to do this problem. So I think that it'll be uh, good for you to have, but it, just know that it's not easy. So I'm going to take an arbitrary point here, and this will be point x comma y. And of course, there's a symmetric point as well. Um, but when I think about just this point, that distance right there, if I assume that this is the origin, 0 comma 0 is the origin, then this distance is going to be the square root of x squared plus y squared. Don't need that closing parentheses there. <clears throat> and then this distance, of course, is the radius. So the radius is along that line. So I can say, well, following Pythagorean theorem, r squared is the square root of x squared plus y squared squared plus, and then what's the other leg? z squared, which it turns out if you square this just becomes x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which is a nice compact uh, way of representing it. Now, of course, we understand there's still going to be, there's a, the actual electric field is pointing off in that direction. There's going to be another point over here, which is symmetric, and it's going to have an electric field that points off in the other direction. Uh, again, we have theta, 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 and theta. <clears throat> and th these are the E's in this direction. And of course, we have components in the, in, that are facing in opposite directions, and those are going to cancel each other out again. And it's only the E sub Z components that, that are going to add. So D E sub Z is going to be equal to D E cosine of theta, which is equal to D E times Z divided by R, which is equal to D E times Z divided by the square root of X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. 
Now, there are lots of places that you can go wrong uh, in this problem. Let's, let's do it together, and then you'll be able to apply the result. But I won't expect you to, be to, I won't expect you to do the, the derivation that we're about to do. I won't expect you to repeat that on a quiz or an exam. I would expect you to be able to use the result, which means, of course, since this is a video, you can put it into like four times speed, or if you wanted to skip two minutes ahead, that's fine. But if you really want to see the hardcore derivation, it's really interesting, I, I think, uh, to be able to see exactly how we get to the final answer. So I'm going to have E sub Z is going to be rho sub S, it's a surface density, divided by 4 pi epsilon 0, and it's a double integral, and it's going to go from minus A over 2 to plus A over 2, and from minus B over 2 to plus B over 2, and this is going to be the cosine of theta divided by R squared times dx dy. And that is going to be rho sub s over 4 pi epsilon 0, the integral, minus a over 2, minus b over 2, up to plus a over 2, plus b over 2. Um, I'm going to take, this is going to be z divided by the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. This term then is cosine of theta. Uh, and then I'm going to have just 1 over x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and that is my r squared term. And then I have dx dy. So now I, I, I can actually, I can pull the z out in front now, because that is a constant uh, when you think of dx and dy. So I have rho sub s times z divided by 4 pi epsilon 0, double integral, minus a over 2 to plus a over 2, minus b over 2 to plus b over 2, and then I've got dx dy divided by x squared plus y squared plus z squared, all to the 3 halves power. And this is when I say, thank God for math mathematicians, because they have figured out this integral, so therefore I don't have to. Um, it turns out then that this integral, and you can I've added this to the table of useful integrals for ECE 430. This integral then is, um, you know what, I'm going to write it like this. I'm going to say it's 1 over z times the arctan, the inverse tangent, of xy divided by z times the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So we got some nastiness there. Um, uh, let's see, a, a good piece of news. Um, we, we can cancel out this z with this z, so that's going to make our life a little bit easier. Oh, I forgot though that there are actually two limits that still need to be installed. So this is minus a over 2 uh, up to a over 2. And just as a reminder, that is, um, that is the limit on dy. So y... Sorry, that's the limit on dx. Let me just go up here and double check that. Um, a is in the y direction, so it's going to be in the y direction. So this is going to be the limit on y. So y is equal to negative a over 2 up to positive a over 2. And then x is equal to negative b over 2 up to positive b over 2. And it's the substituting of these limits that's going to be the, the biggest hassle for us. Um, the integral itself, since we were able to look it up in a table, wasn't too bad. So we have rho sub s over 4 pi epsilon 0. Uh, and now I'm going to plug in the upper and lower integrals, uh, upper and lower limits. And I end up with an arctangent of, and I need to plug in y. So this is x times a over 2 divided by z times the square root of x squared plus a over 2 squared plus z squared. So all I did was plug in everywhere that I saw y, I plug in a over 2. Then I subtract the same thing, but with a negative. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. It's, and I have to close the, the arc tangent. And I subtract off the same thing, but now I substitute in negative a over 2. So this is the arctan of x times negative a over 2 divided by z times the square root of x squared plus negative a over 2 squared plus z squared. 
and then I still have to plug in x equals negative b over 2 up to x equals positive b over 2, but I'll do that here in a second. Let's take a minute and observe that the denominators are identical. So these denominators are going to be exactly the same because when I square that negative a over 2, the negative sign is going to go away. I can then also see that I'm basically the numerators are the same except for a negative sign. And if I remember that the tangent of negative theta is equal to the negative tangent, whoops, oh yeah, the negative arctangent of theta. Let me try that again. The arctangent of negative theta is the negative arctangent of theta, which means essentially that I can take this negative sign right here and move it out in front and cancel that negative sign. So it turns out that these two terms are identical and they're adding together. So I have rho sub s over 4 pi epsilon 0 times 2 arctangent of x times a over 2 divided by z times the square root of x squared plus a over 2 squared plus z squared. Still have to evaluate it at x equals negative b over 2 up to x equals positive b over 2. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and plug that in. I'll, I'll uh, let's see, do I have enough room? I think I'm going to have enough room. Oh, sorry, don't know what's going on here. Give it a second. Okay. I think I have too much writing on the screen. It's, it's going pretty slow. So I have 2 rho sub s over 4 pi epsilon 0 times the arctangent of b over 2 times a over 2 divided by z times the square root of b over 2 squared plus a over 2 squared plus z squared minus the arctangent of negative b over 2 times a over 2 divided by z times the square root of b over 2, oh, negative b over 2, the quantity squared, plus a over 2 squared plus z squared. Again, I'm going to take this minus sign, I'm going to move it out in front and cancel that minus sign. So this becomes uh, 2 rho sub s over 4 pi epsilon 0 times 2 times the arctangent of a, B, and I'm going to move the 4 down into the denominator, 4z times the square root of b over 2 squared plus a over 2 squared plus z squared. Uh, this 2 and this 2 and this 4 can cancel each other out. And then I'm left with a 4. And, and what else I'm going to do? I'm going to take half of this 4. So I'm going to leave 2 behind. And I'm going to move 2 under the square root. So I have rho sub s over pi epsilon 0 times the arctangent of a b over 2z. And when I move the 2 under the square root, it becomes 4. That's actually going to cancel those over 2s. So I'll say a squared plus b squared. There's nothing to cancel with the z, so it becomes plus 4 z squared. And then let me just compare that to my final answer. And excellent. Yes, that is our final answer. So, a pretty challenging problem uh, that we had to do two, uh, we had to do a, an integration, then we had to do two layers of uh, plugging in the limits, but we get an interesting result. Now, the really interesting result would be what happens when we take the limit of that as a and b both go to infinity. So if we calculate the electric field at a distance z above an infinite plane of charge. So now I'm going to take the limit as a goes to infinity and as b goes to infinity of rho sub s over pi epsilon 0 times the arctangent of a b divided by 2z square root of a squared plus b squared plus 4z squared. Now, 
This is where mathematicians and engineers differ a little bit. A mathematician would have a very detailed proof of what I'm about to sort of wave my hands at. If a squared and b squared are both infinitely large, then the 4z squared is going to become insignificant. And if a squared and b squared are both infinitely large, then they're both approximately the same as each other. And again, that's a mathematician would be very upset at, at this. But this, I can, I can represent this as uh, rho sub s is a constant, pi epsilon 0 is a constant. I'm going to take the limit, and now I'm just going to have one, and I'll arbitrarily choose a, the arctangent of, the numerator is now going to be a squared, so I'm just going to say a is approximately equal to b. A squared divided by 2 times z, and left underneath the, un, underneath the square root here, I'm going to have the square root of 2a squared. Well, let's see, this uh, a squared under, this <coughs> under the square root is going to be just going to become a, and so therefore this part will cancel with that part, and that means that this is the limit of a divided by 2z times the square root of 2, so that means that this whole thing is going to go to infinity, and the arctangent of infinity, let me just make a note here, the arctangent of infinity, also something that a mathematician would probably lose their mind over, is, uh, is equal to pi over 2. And so therefore this becomes rho sub s over pi epsilon 0 times pi over 2. Those pi's cancel, and I'm left with rho sub s over 2 epsilon 0. A very important result that we're going to come back and see at least two more times. So let's remember that if we're, an inf if we're any distance away from an infinite plane of charge, the electric field is going to be rho sub s over 2 epsilon 0. Very interestingly, it doesn't depend on how far away you are from the infinite plane of charge. So there is no rho in that calculation. Okay, our last major calculation for today, let's do the same thing but with a circle. So now I have a solid disk of uniform charge, and at this point you're probably getting pretty accustomed to the pattern. I'm going to choose a spot here, and I'm going to choose a spot here. Um, we're going to see that there's going to be an electric field there, there's going to be an electric field there. Sorry for the sloppiness. Um, I know that I'm going to have theta here and theta here, and this is going to be R. And I will refer to this distance here as being rho. So this is going to be rho. So let's see, I know that R squared is equal to rho squared plus Z squared. And I also know that the surface charge density rho sub s is equal to the total charge divided by the surface area, which is pi a squared. It turns out that this one's going to be a little bit easier than the previous one. Uh, as we often find, when there's more symmetry in the problem, it makes the problem a little bit easier to solve. DEZ is equal to DE cosine of theta, and that's equal to... DE times Z divided by R, which is DE times Z divided by the square root of Z squared plus rho squared. DE, the overall DE, is just going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 times DQ over R squared. Uh, and we can, we can replace the dq, so 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 becomes rho sub s times uh, the surface area ds divided by r squared. Uh, and then I can write it out as the full integral. e sub z is equal to rho sub s times z divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 the integral, there's actually a double integral, integral of rho from 0 to a, and integral of phi from 0 up to 2 pi. So just consider that we're, we're, we're sweeping out, first of all, we're sweeping out in, in the rho direction, and then once I've, once I've got a line that's in that direction, now I'm going to sweep it in this direction. So it'll look sort of like one of those radar things that's spinning in a circle. And if I spin that a whole 2 pi, or 360 degrees, then I will have colored the entire, the entire disk. So this, uh, this then becomes z divided by the square root of rho squared plus z squared. That's my cosine of theta multiplied by 1 over rho squared plus z squared. That's my r squared. 
uh, then multiplied by what is this ds? Well, as we saw when we talked about uh, uh, when we talked about uh, coordinate systems, this is equal to uh, rho rho d phi d rho, or what's sometimes referred to as rho d rho d phi. So this will be uh, there's a rho in here and a d phi and a d rho. So e sub z is going to be rho sub s times z divided by 4 pi epsilon 0. And notice that absolutely nothing in this integral depends on phi. So I can do the integral of phi from 0 to 2 pi, and it just becomes 2 pi minus 0. Or I'll just refer to this as 2 pi. Uh, and so this now is just one integral from 0 to a. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and combine a few things together here. Okay, I discovered a small mistake um, one step ago. You'll notice that I had a z here, and then I also had the z here. And that, that you don't get to count it in both places. I've already pulled it out in front because it's a constant, so this is going to be a 1 right here. Sorry about that. So I have, uh, this is going to be a rho. It's going to be a rho divided by uh, rho squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power. And that's going to be with respect to rho. And that's another integral that is that is available in your table of useful integrals. This then works out to be rho sub s times z times 2 pi divided by 4 pi epsilon 0. Um, and then here's what that integral is equal to. It's minus 1 divided by the square root of rho squared plus z squared. And that needs to be evaluated between 0 and a. Uh, the 2 pi can cancel with most of the 4 pi, leaving behind just a 2. So e sub z is equal to rho sub s times z over 2 epsilon 0. And if I plug in a here, I get minus 1 over the square root of a squared plus z squared minus minus 1 divided by the square root of 0 squared plus z squared. It turns out that this term is positive and this term is negative. And just for your sanity, I'm going to swap those two terms, but I want you to recognize that I swapped them. This becomes rho sub s z over 2 epsilon 0 times uh, 1 over z, 1 over z minus 1 over the square root of a squared plus z squared. And I'm going to take this z right here. I'm going to pop it inside the parentheses. So e sub z becomes rho sub s over 2 epsilon 0, epsilon 0, times, and z times 1 over z just gives me 1 minus, and then it becomes a z over the square root of a squared plus z squared. And I believe, again, that's our final answer. And then very interestingly, this is my favorite thing about today, we're going to, uh, we're going to use the result from the, from the disk, and we're going to calculate the electric field at a distance z above an infinite plane of charge. So now, again, we're going to take the limit as now the radius, the limit as the radius goes to infinity. So when I take the limit as the radius approaches infinity, it's the limit of rho sub s over 2 epsilon 0 times 1 minus z divided by the square root of a squared plus z squared. Okay, well, if a squared is going to infinity, then this z squared is irrelevant. And if that is now just z divided by a, and if a is going to infinity, then this whole term is going to go to 0. And that leaves me with just a 1 in the brackets. So this becomes rho sub s over 2 epsilon 0. And it turns out that if I scroll back up, rho sub s over 2 epsilon 0, rho sub s over 2 epsilon 0, rho sub s over 2 epsilon 0 is exactly the same answer that we got right here. So when we, when we did it as a rectangle and we expanded the rectangle out to infinity, or when we did it as a circle and we expanded the circle out to infinity, we got the same answer both times. And that really gives us a lot of confidence in the fact that our work is probably correct on both of those calculations. As we're going to see next time with Gauss's Law, there is another way to derive this result, and it is correct, in fact.
Now we could do a three-dimensional calculation, but you're probably at your wit's end right now anyway. So we're going to stop here. I'm just going to say three-dimensional calculations are, are much harder. And for anything other than a trivial geometry, we're not going to be able to do it. Uh, so just, just be aware of the fact that three-dimensional calculations can be uh, significantly harder than, than one- and two-dimensional calculations. I've got the summary here talking a little bit about the different types of charge densities. I should mention that there is a typo here, which I'm going to correct in your notes, but I need it to be correct in, in this version as well. There's That's actually in the denominator, so I'll correct that for your version, but I just want you to know that there was a typo there. Um, and then we've got the calculation for uh, if you've got a line of charge or a line segment of charge and you're just above the line segment. If you are, if you have an infinite line of charge in both directions and you're a certain distance above it, if you have a thin loop of charge, so that's this one, and you're above it, if you have uh, the center of a rectangle of charge, so if you're something like this and you're a distance above it, or if you're above the center of a circle of charge, and this circle of charge is actually a solid circle and you're above it, or if the electric field, if, if, the, if the, the plane extends in all directions, and I don't really know how to represent that, but if it's extending in all directions and you're a certain distance above it, then that's what this, that's what this equation right here would represent. So I appreciate you sticking through with today's lesson. Uh, trust me that most of the lessons are not going to be this mathematically rigorous, but it was really important to be able to build this toolkit of electric field calculations that you can apply in a lot of different other problems.